Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, again, I'm Glenn Havermail, and we're going to present, uh, Heather and I are going to present The Power of Money uh, with an introduction to our EcoSound project. I got it. Um, just to start with, I, this is all, this is 95% of my time is spent on this project, so it's what I think about every day. So I tend to assume that acronyms and things are, you know, common knowledge. So feel free to stop me at any point if I really start flying on a tangent, because it happens. Okay, first I want to just talk about uh, the Global Marine Programs uh, Division. It was developed in 1993 as a conservation group with an emphasis on, ma on maintaining uh, neutrality in environmental conservation issues. And uh, one of the main focuses is the Sustainable Fisheries Initiative, of which EcoSound, which we're going to talk about today, is a cornerstone. Okay, a quick, real brief outline. We're going to talk about commercial fishing. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, how much people know, so it'll just be a very brief overview. The same with aquaculture. Uh, talk about where we stand now as far as trends, as far as management's concerned. Uh, talk about the issues that lead to those management plans being put in place. Uh, talk about how the industry, the seafood industry, has responded. Uh, touch on what other NGOs have done, nonprofits. And finally, uh, Heather's going to tell you about the EcoSound project, how it developed, and where we stand now. Okay, we can, we can take wild fisheries by wild. I'm talking about boats in the ocean as opposed to farming, but we'll get to that. Uh, when we talk about wild fisheries, we can broadly uh, can come up with three broad categories, artisanal, recreational, and, and commercial. Artisanal, uh, small scale, um, Recreational, these are things like that we see uh, out of Cape Cod, uh, head boats, charter boats, these type of things, and commercial, uh, commercial fishing, which is aimed at making a profit, aimed at harvesting fish to make a profit. And basically, uh, that's what we're focused on, and this goes anywhere from the small boats of Maine uh, to these huge super trawlers like this one here uh, that have a capacity of catching 80 tons every several hours. Oh, okay. Good idea. So, uh, some, exa some examples of commercial fishing gear. Uh, otter trawl. Basically, an otter trawl pulls a funnel-shaped net on the seabed, and it's sort of wound here. These two doors are uh, set on the seabed, and their purpose is to keep the uh, net open horizontally. It's, he it's held open vertically through, uh, basically, floats on, on the headline or the top of the net. And this is a scallop dredge. Uh, scallop dredge is pulled in this direction, and we have a lot of those uh, in New England. It's a very heavy piece of machinery, several, weighing several tons. Um, as scallops live on or in the seabed, it's, it actually uh, cuts into the seabed somewhat significantly, depending on the configuration. Now, uh, just one quick note. I'm a fisheries biologist, and uh, so I studied selectivity and gear, but I... So I know a little bit about aquaculture, but I'm certainly not an aquaculture scientist. So I, I think I can give an overview, but that's not won't be too detailed. But anyway, uh, aquaculture is fish farming, essentially, and uh, we deal with shell, uh, the farming of shellfish, finfish, and uh, other organisms. So some examples of aquaculture. The top uh, is a picture of a salmon farm in Chile. Uh, these pens are about 60 feet long and about 50 feet deep. They're really enormous. Um, and as you can see, in the distance, multiple pens. Uh, these things are very sturdy. This is probably as technologically advanced as aquaculture is right now. And then we have shrimp farming, which would be the other end of that spectrum. Uh, this is a picture of shrimp farming in Thailand. They're basically digging out ponds, flooding them, throwing shrimp in, uh, in about eight months, harvesting them. The harvesting method is just draining the lake, letting the sediment dry, starting over with a new pond. Very basic. Okay, so those are the types of fisheries we're looking at. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about management. And I just like this quote. This is from um, Thomas Huxley in 1883, uh, who at that time was considered a f you know, fabulous fisheries biologist. But uh, the reason I like to use it is that first line, I believe that, that all fisheries are inexhaustible. Suggesting that, and this only changed in, in 
recent decades that there's nothing we can do to seriously impact the number of fish in the sea. This is a graph from the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and uh, it basically shows demand over time. And uh, as our population continues to grow, the demand is going to continue to grow. So we're going to have to figure out, fisheries managers are going to have to figure out how to compensate for that. Uh, the other thing I like about this is uh, the light blue is wild harvested and the dark blue is aquaculture. And as you can see, wild fisheries sort of plateaus around the uh, 90s, early 90s. And you can see that aquaculture has compensated for that and we'll con continue to see that in the future. So what are the issues that when, when we look at sustainable seafood and, and we look at our project, what are the issues in the two types of fisheries, uh, fishing and, and aquaculture, that we're looking at? Uh, one, of the first, one of the first major issues is stock status, and that's basically looking at not the individuals, but the stock, uh, a interbreeding population. Um, very important. These things undulate naturally, and then, of course, we, have, we affect it as well, and so our second criteria is overfishing. Uh, this, I think this trawler is a, a nice picture. Um, you know, when you look at the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands, you've got enormous fleets of these boats that, like I mentioned, harvest 80 metric tons every two hours. They fish 24 hours a day, so the impact can be very significant. Bycatch. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, catch from a, from a scallop dredge, and as you can see, there's a flounder in there, some skate. So even something that is really specific, like a scallop dredge, can can collect a lot of incidental bycatch. Habitat alteration. Does the gear affect the seabed? And if so, how and is it how negative how negative is the impact? So this is a picture of a trawl door. I mentioned those are the, the pieces of metal that keep the net open uh, horizontally. And as you can see, uh, as this thing is dragged across the seabed, it creates a huge cloud of sediment and resuspension. And then social concerns, going back to the Alaskan fishery fisheries uh, the, the crab fisheries out there are, are called a derby fishery. And essentially, you have one quota for an entire fleet. A day is set, a time is set, and the fleet goes, and everybody collects as much of that quota as possible. So weather and uh, conditions do not play a part because you really have to get out there and catch what you can to make money. And, and thus, you know, 40, 40 guys die, are dying out there every year at present. Okay, issues with aquaculture. Uh, biological pollution, uh, we're talking about uh, waste and food, uh, overfeeding. Chemical, we're talking about antibiotics um, that are used that can flush out. Disease, uh, basically, in, in the case of an escapement, the, the farm fish can spread a disease in wild populations. And additionally, with escapes, you have the potential to change uh, the genetics of, of a wild stock and habitat alteration. Uh, in Thailand, this, used to, this was a huge topic about five years ago, but we had mangrove destruction when they were creating these new ponds because the idea was let's not wait for it to dry, let's, let's build a new pond. And so all these mangroves were being ripped out. But that's since changed uh, sort of due to, due to the pressure of the industry to move them further inland away from the mangroves. Okay, so with these issues, how is the industry... How has the industry, industry responded? First, we have dolphin safe, uh, dolphin safe tuna. And essentially, in 1990, uh, this logo came out. Um, and if you, essentially, if any boat in, in Atlantic waters, U.S. Atlantic waters, is using an, an, an encircling method and catches a single dolphin, then they're not allowed to use this logo. Uh, next, we have... Aquaculture Certification Council, and they're relatively new. They were established in 2002, and they're trying to set a standard. They're trying to develop a standard that across the board, uh, if you meet these standards, then you're going to be able to use that logo. Probably all familiar with USDA Organic. That's a federal, federal standard. Uh, Marine Stewardship Council. This is a group that looks at fish stocks and then certifies them. According to, uh, according to their specific standard. And uh, basically, 
what's what's different about Marine Swordship Council is then you then you then you'll have seafood in the store that will have the sticker on it. And so the push is to have this sticker, and then you can say your stuff's sustainable, and someone can see that and, and know. And I just threw Whole Foods in because uh, they're really they really market organic uh, produce. They are also using the MSC logo for salmon. Okay, I'm now going to pass it off to Heather, who's going to tell you about NGOs and our project. So while Glenn gave you an overview of what the response has been um, to some of the issues surrounding the sustainability of seafood and fishery resources, um, what he gave you, in fact, were a number of different um, marketing and labeling plans that businesses have been using. Um, in terms of NGOs' response, what we mean here is what has the environmental community um, been thinking in, about in terms of sustainable fisheries? And we broke this down into a few bullets. Uh, legal action, this is just two of, um, there have definitely been more uh, legal actions on behalf of fisheries resources, but these in particular were in New England. Um, 1992, the Conservation Law Foundation sued the government and the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, on on the implication that there was a lot of overfishing going on on the fisheries that were here in New England and they weren't doing enough about it. Similar to this lawsuit in um, 2000 that's since been upheld and new regulations are actually supposed to go into place in September of 2004. Uh, boycotts are another um, method that a number of environmental groups have used to bring the public's attention towards sustainable seafood issues, give swordfish a break was a previous campaign on behalf of SeaWeb, and you see the logo up here on the right, and the, and the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, that really introduced the idea of boycotts through chefs and through restaurants. So there was uh, a lot of sign-on on behalf of chefs to stop selling swordfish, and that's what currently is going on with this Take a Pass on Chilean Sea Bass boycott, which is going on right now. You'll see a number of chefs have actually taken that off um, their menu, and we'll actually speak to Chilean Sea Bass right at the very end. And then seafood guides is another thing that some of you may be aware of, the little wallet cards that some of you might have in your pocket if you take them to restaurants or to um, supermarkets or something. The Monterey Bay Aquarium puts out this card in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, National Audubon Society and Environmental Defense also put out, um, they put out either cards or information that essentially highlights best seafood choices that you can make when you go somewhere to purchase seafood or things that are the worst, and sometimes there's a gradient of red, yellow, green. Um, the Seafood Choices Alliance is really a group, of, uh, a group of organizations, primarily in the environmental community, that have tried to come together and address all sorts of environmental criteria about people that are concerned about the sustainability of our fisheries. So... The Chefs Collaborative, again, is a group of restaurants, um, of chefs working at restaurants. Um, the Conservation Law Foundation, Environmental Defense, Monterey Bay, Audubon. I bring these up because this is a group that we've been involved with since its inception. It's a link to the environmental community that we have had, and it's really one of the primary reasons in some ways why this EcoSound project has developed. Um, the aquarium was approached in 2000 by representatives of Royal Ahold and Ahold USA. Uh, these Royal Ahold is the third in the world, the third largest distributor of seafood. It owns a number of different supermarkets uh, within the. I'll go back one second, just explain a little more. Um, it owns a number of supermarkets within the U.S., but also in Latin America, Asia, Europe, and. We were approached to develop a project that would look at primarily the U.S. stores' sustainability and traceability of their seafood. And we were really approached by them not only on, on the grounds that we had these links and partnerships with other groups in the environmental community, but again, as going back to what Glenn said about our development of the conservation department here at the aquarium, that we had this um, position in the community, not just with environmental groups, but with fishing groups, with managers governing fishery resources as being a place where we've previously held a lot of forums and things that bring people together to speak 
um, on solutions and look at the challenges that face people looking at uh, sustainable fishery resources. I'm going to go in a little bit more to what the EcoSound project is, but essentially from the perspective of the AHO team, it was to partner with the aquarium to, look, to address the traceability and sustainability of seafood and provide their customers with a place that if they walked in the door at their supermarkets, they would feel good about the seafood that they were buying. And that was essentially their end result of this project. It's a very long-term project to look at the seafood that they are sourcing from. And from the aquarium's point of view, this is a, um, as opposed to the seafood watch cards or even the boycotts that addressed in, what individual c c consumers can do on a one-by-one -one basis, this was the opportunity for us to take a different tack and to work with a large-scale buying corporation that had a lot of power to make decisions and move in the direction of sustainability. Um, so this is to give you, this next slide is to give you an overview of a number of the supermarket, chain, supermarket chains here in the United States. And the purchasing power, in fact, that they do have now that they're buying primarily all their seafood on behalf of Ahold USA, which is a, the parent company of all these supermarkets. And so before um, I turn it back to Glenn, who's going to actually give you just a few specifics of a couple species we've already started looking at. We, this is the pilot year of this partnership with Ahold USA, and we think it's a pretty exciting and innovative um, project that takes a different stance than what is currently going on out there and provides um, a lot of a lot of uh, criteria and standards and things that the environmental co community are looking into, but provides those back to a specific buyer. And I'm going to let Glenn go over a little bit of the criteria that we have on specific species. And we'll take some questions at the end about the project. Okay. okay. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're looking at, we're, we're taking a species that, is, that you're going to find in, in a seafood case at one of these supermarkets, and then we're doing a report on it um, with a lot of research. And essentially we start looking at, we start with just an overview of the, of, of the fishery, really looking at the history, then looking at the stock assessment again, the, the population as a whole, then looking at the population dynamics of that species to look at, you know, maturity, agent maturity, agent recruitment, these type of things. Uh, then look at the fisheries management plan. What's, what's the authoritative body and uh, what is the plan to date doing in terms of rebuilding? Habitat alteration. Uh, again, like I mentioned with the commercial gears, these things, some gears tend to, to really interact with, with the, the habitat. We have something called a central fish habitat, which is uh, basically an area necessary for spawning and growth. So, you know, is the fishery hitting into essential fish habitat, these sort of things. And then social concerns, like I mentioned with the Alaskan fisheries. And again, what, as Heather mentioned, what other NGOs uh, are, are doing and, and what their opinions are. So, uh, to date we've done nine species, and then I wanted to just go through two uh, and sort of explain how we make our recommendations and whatnot. So snow crab, when, when we looked at snow crab, we looked at the Canadian fishery on the east coast and the U.S. fishery, uh, which is on the west coast, up in the Bering Sea, Gulf of Alaska. And we found that the Alaskan fishery, while the management plan is decent, uh, the biology and, the, and the, the, the earlier overfishing has the stock on the brink of collapse, and it's most likely that it will collapse and there won't be a fishery next year. Meanwhile, the uh, East Coast Canadian fishery is well managed, and it's, it's managed in a system that gives every boat an individual quota. So although there is one quota for the entire fleet, every boat has its own private quota, so, meaning there's no need to go out in bad weather. These guys fish in the, in the summer, um, and it's, it's a great system, and it's a very healthy stock. So our recommendation uh, was, to sh was to shift focus of buying as much as possible on to Canada. And fortunately, uh, they were already sourcing 95% from Canada, so we're going to try to push it to 100, but um, they're already buying primarily uh, Canadian. 
And I wanted to just finish with uh, Patagonia toothfish or Chilean sea bass. This is a fairly new fishery uh, because it's a deep water fishery, and there's only about 20 years, 20, 30 years of uh, data. So we looked at the entire aggregated stocks as one, as opposed to trying to figure out if there were separate stocks. And basically, there's, uh, there are management plans in place, but there is a high instance of illegal, unregulated, um, unreported fisher, fishing, IUU fishing. Uh, and basically, I think several years ago, the statistic was something like 60% of U.S. import is IUU. So um, because, because they're not doing, there's, not, there's not much being done about it, we have recommended that they don't, that they don't, uh, that they don't sell Chilean sea bass. And they've agreed. And so right now, if you were to go into um, Giant Carlisle, which is the first operating company that we've really rolled this project out, uh, the, you, would, you, you wouldn't find it. And there wouldn't be any ad, ad, advertising or promotion if you asked for it. Uh, the manager should basically explain the problem and give you an alternative. And um, you, you can't get it, which is really our first success story. And we look forward to rolling these into other, the other operating companies in the near future. Thank you.
favor of marine preservation. We can take more questions at the end on this project, um, depending on how time goes. Okay, is that going to work? Is that good enough? Okay. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today and want to thank the Lowell Institute and Ken Mallory for the opportunity to have this series, which complements our current uh, NSF-funded Living Links exhibit, and for the opportunity to speak with you today. And Christina, I finally got the chance to have that picture. <laughs> um, this is my aquatic conservation toolbox. Don't be overwhelmed. I'm not going to run through all of these. I just basically, um, it's been useful to me to think about how you can affect change, ranging from reaching the public, policies, management, and ecological efforts. Um, Glenn and Heather talked about a very powerful way to boost consumer demand by working with the business side to uh, rapidly ach achieve a global effect. And I'm going to talk about the second um, point in reaching the public, which is using values-based education uh, through linking with the faith community. Um, here's an outline of my talk, Reaching People Through Environmental Values, uh, picking up on where Aaron Oliver left off in our first lecture, exploring the connections between science and faith, examples of environmental efforts in the faith community, and Changing Hearts and Mind, the project that I helped catalyze in Papua New Guinea. It's been 40 years after the release of Silent Spring and the birth of the modern environmental movement, yet we have not convinced sufficient numbers of people to make the necessary behavioral changes. Many programs have tried to change behavior and attitudes through education, assuming that once you have the fact, you'll change your behavior. But as you learned last week, those of you who are here from James Prochaska, education can start a change process but not take people all the way to action. Providing people with information doesn't necessarily result in behavioral change because behavior is the result of many forces, values, attitudes, gender, social norms, skills, econ economics, time, options, laws, and habits. Um, now, in 1996, the, um, a poll conducted by the Ocean Project found that Americans rank, Glenn, where did that laser pointer go? Americans rank uh, environment at the very bottom of their, so this is from 1996, of their concerns, so below education, health care, crime, and social security. This poll was done actually uh, before 1996, and exactly the same results. Environment was almost always at the bottom of people's concerns. The Biodiversity Project notes that support for biodiversity protection is easily eroded across nearly half of the, whoop, across nearly half of the population um, when other considerations come into play, such as jobs, property rights, or human convenience. What can we do about this? To increase action, we must reach out to people's values. Values are long-lasting core, long core beliefs that determine our attitudes. We must make biodiversity priceless, as priceless as trying to save the health of an ailing relative. No cost is too high for you to save your loved ones. We must do the same for biodiversity, although I point out that uh, Nature ran an economic analysis a couple of years ago that indicated the cost of truly protecting global biodiversity was actually low and feasible, so it's not necessarily priceless, meaning really expensive. We could protect global biodiversity if we, if we set our minds to it. Now, our first speaker in the series, Aaron Oliver, spoke of the benefit of taking a values-based approach to conservation. Values motivate people over the long-term values-based messages work. Of course, advertisers know this. They sell everything from SUVs to beer, uh, like the Chevy and Love campaign, if somehow buying a Chevy is going to, to bring you love. Um, and political consultants use them to sell politicians. Both the Biodiversity Project and Ocean Project have polling data that support the value of this approach. The Biodiversity Project asked the U.S. public in 2002, if you could choose one of six reasons, which one would you say is most important to you personally as a reason for you to care about protecting the environment? The choices are, I have a responsibility to future generations. Nature is God's work. The, I shortened this. The actual um, question that they gave was to protect the balance of nature for you and your family to enjoy health. I hope I paraphrased it correctly. Um, but basically, to enjoy a healthy life, to protect, to protect the environment. I respect nature for its own sake. I appreciate nature's beauty and to protect America's natural history. And you can see the most important values, uh, if you're forced to pick one, are stewardship, responsibility to future generations, and God. 
23% of the U.S. public, um, that was their primary motivation for protecting biodiversity. Interestingly, of the 44% of the American public, they did cluster analysis, so they broke up the U.S. public into different demographic groups like suburban 40-year-old um, women, which now is me, I guess, and um, uh, Republican homeowning Westerners. You know, they, they're all these different cluster groups. But 44% of the American public that is least likely to support biodiversity, people within this group are actually most likely to respond to an environmental message that nature is God's, was God's creation and that humans must respect God's work. So even this hard-to-reach group may be responsive to an environmental message based upon their values, upon their religious beliefs. Building upon and rearticulating the connection between God and creation can help change or strengthen people's attitude about the environment and can be used to change their daily behaviors. Now, this slide I adapted from Aaron Oliver, and I just want to have you focus on the, two, on the yellow uh, s statements. A faith-based approach reaches out to values people already have. So the point about a values-based approach is it's not a, you're, you're not trying to impart new values to people. You're pulling out what people already hold dear, uh, which, is, which is much longer lasting. And the second thing on social marketing, which is really trying to, to, to uh, use a message uh, to influence behavior, that um, people will accept a message if they see it in accordance with their needs and values and they feel that the results of the trial are viewed positively by their peers. Religion provides people with social support and a community of peers which can influence their own behavior. This issue of peer support is critical. If no one does a given sustainable practice, it may be difficult to get its acceptance in the community. If everyone does a certain negative practice, it probably will be difficult to change it too. Okay, now exploring connections between science and faith. Science and the faith community have much in common in our desire to protect the earth. I believe that science and religion are overlapping fields of authority. Stephen Jay Gould calls them overlap, or actually he believes they're non-overlapping magisteria. But basically the gist is you've got two, I think that they're two overlapping fields, uh, two overlapping human disciplines. And see, I finally had the chance to use the Venn diagrams I learned in the new math um, when I was in elementary school. <laughs> So uh, what I think the, the way science, the science, science and the faith community overlap are, are these three areas, uh, a deep and abiding concern for the earth, um, a recognition of the interconnectedness of life, which we have in our Living Links exhibit, and wonder and awe towards nature, recognizing that nature is sacred, using the meaning, sa sacred meaning of entitled to reverence and respect. So I'm not saying all scientists believe in God, but I'm saying that, science, that environmentalists believe that nature is worthy of reverence, of respect, uh, something of protection, a place to renew the human spirit and refresh our emotional and mental health. I would note that both disciplines have the potential to restore a sense of humility of man's place in the world, but in the past, have, they both have rather enhanced man's hubris. Uh, Tim Weiskell has some very, formerly of the Harvard Divinity School, some very provocative quotes. We live on the third planet from the sun, our closest star. As stars go, it's not a very big one. In biological terms, humans provide no essential functions for the survival of other large communities of life forms, save perhaps for our own domesticated animals and plants and parasites. If we disappear, it's probable that they will not survive in their current forms for very long. But the vast majority of the Earth's organisms can do perfectly well, indeed perhaps thrive even better without us or our biological associates. None of this, he says, is news. We, yet the curious fact is we refuse to believe it. We continue to strut and prance about with a sense of supreme self-importance as if all creation were put in place for our benefit. As the zoologist David Ehrenfeld observed, in spite of what science has revealed about our place in the universe, we still believe that the force of gravity exists in order to make it easier for us to sit down. Um, how can we help move the public from awareness to adoption of behaviors? I think this effort can best be achieved with a collaborative effort among scientists, conservationists, and the faith community. Scientists can help by helping the public understand basic ecological principles, the interconnections of species and habitats, and understand how we as individuals and society affect biodiversity. But also scientists can help by conveying their passion and love for the, for the earth, their passion for the animals that they care about, for the plants that they study. Religious groups can help by advancing the notion that there's something else besides economic development, and that is quality of life for us, our children, and the others on this planet. Uh, there have been a couple studies recently that uh, have documented empirically what all of us know. If you accumulate more goods, you're not happier. 
Okay, now I want to hit the, the... I'm going to show a couple minutes of the Union of Concerned Scientists video um, uh, that, link, that discusses science and religion. This is about a three and a half minute video clip. Be deeply valued. It's precious. This is E.O. Wilson. And I like to say that it doesn't matter how you view the origin of the creation, you come to the same conclusion. Diversity of life that surrounds us. It's a gift. It's something that was bequeathed to us, and it's something that we bequeath back down onto our descendants. Procession of animals to the altar for blessing. There was a great deal of uncertainty, skepticism, curiosity, um, and um, yeah, as to how it would be received. But when we opened the great two ton bronze doors of the cathedral, there were 4,000 silent people in this great sacred space. And we watched an elephant, a camel, and a llama, an eagle, a hawk, a pony. And as they all moved down the nave, the length of two football fields, people wept. And as nearly as I could understand, people were experiencing a moment of reconciliation. is for churches and synagogues to open their doors more fully to life itself. Invite life in, the wonder of life, the reverence of life. It doesn't have to be an elephant or a llama coming down the nave to the altar. It just can be a sense that what's out there now belongs in here, inside our congregations and inside our hearts. I want to quickly go over uh, examples of environmental actions by the faith community. Environmental, governmental, and religious leaders around the world are beginning to explore the relationship between environmental principles and fundamental values. A number of academic conferences and studies have linked science, faith, and the environment, including the 1998 Harvard University Conference Series on Religions of the World and Ecology, the 1997 Floating Study Cruise on the Black Sea. There's plenty of, new, of religious organizations that are working on environmental issues. The Eco-Justice Working Group of National Council of Churches, the National Religious Partnership for the Environment, um, and so on. To date, uh, these partnerships have been largely initiated by the faith community and not by conservationists. Speaking, speaking from experience, I used to work for the Nature Conservancy. While mainstream environmental groups such as the Nature Conservancy or Conservation International respect the pa and recognize the power of indigenous religions and leaders, they've been uh, relatively slower to collaborate with the mainstream faith community. 
uh, to be fair to environmentalists, who typically, myself included, who typically have either a science or policy background, they have been doubtful, somewhat doubtful that religious groups have an environmental agenda over the long term, beyond Earth Day. The public is equally suspicious of environmentalists who deliver religious messages, preferring to hear those messages from trusted clergy. And that's one key, key uh, point of, of uh, conveying messages. You have to be the right speaker for conveying the messages. Um, a number of environmental organizations, how, are ever, however, are starting their first ventures into this arena. IUCN's chief scientist, Jeff McNeely, recently encouraged such partnerships. The Biodiversity Project has created um, sensitivity guides for environmentalists to work with the faith community so that the two, two, uh, two groups can, can get along. WWF International created a conservation and religion network to enhance alliances. And WWF also organized a sacred gifts for the Earth meeting of 11 faiths in Nepal. The Nigerian Conservation Foundation has created educational materials highlighting environmental passages in the Bible and the Koran. This cartoon says, and bring two of every species so that they all may be preserved. And Noah says, you mean except those that threaten jobs and economic development. <laughs> Uh, the, the Evangelical Environmental Network brought members of the faith community to Washington to support the Endangered Species Act in 1995-1996. The uh, Ev Evangelical Environmental Network created the message, the Endangered Species Act is our Noah's Ark. Congress and special interests are trying to sink it. This message and the efforts by the faith community actually contributed strongly to delaying congressional action that would have seriously weakened the Endangered Species Act. Um, Actually, pairing of a scientist with, and a religious leader together with policymakers is even more effective. This creates a one-two punch. Politicians can't ignore the combination of rational and moral appeals. Uh, forestry NGOs, forestry non-governmental groups have used this to great effect. Uh, here's just a list of just a couple examples of other uh, efforts linking the environment and the faith community. Paul Butler is an ornithologist that works in the Caribbean, and he really started out by getting uh, ch school children in the Caribbean to become proud of one bird species on their island. And they would have t-shirt contests and songs and a whole variety of ways to, to create a groundswell of concern for one species. He has, uh, in partnership with the Palau Conservation Society and Turks and Caicos Trust, now incorporates religious values into his work. So um, what they've done is they've created a program that includes theater, T-shirts, songs, bumper stickers, sermon materials, and other efforts to create pride. Um, in Massachusetts, you had the effort to what would Jesus drive on the SUVs, to, trying to convince people to stop driving SUVs. Interfaith Power and Light, actually there's a Massachusetts Power and Light, uh, even um, Episcopalian Power and Light here, is trying to uh, change their, their community on uh, energy use and the Waterman Stewardship for the Chesapeake uh, was a project in Maryland that um, worked with faith communities to try to um, improve uh, sustainability of the Chesapeake Bay. For the last four years, the New England, New England Aquarium has collaborated on an exciting interdenominational and interdisciplinary grassroots project linking environment and faith in Papua New Guinea. The primary goals are to change the public's attitude and behavior towards the environment by linking their existing religious faith with environmental values. So there's no proselytizing, there's no converting. This is just pulling out passages of their existing faith. Testing this conservation model by documenting whether attitudinal change has occurred. That's my, my contribution to it on the science side. Now why P&G? I mean, besides I really like to be there, <laughs> love the South Pacific, it is a very good reason it's for its biodiversity. Globally, it's of the highest priority for conservation, both rainforests and reefs. For example, it's on World Wildlife Fund's Global 200, third largest remaining tract of rainforest in the world, a very high percentage of endemic species, um, almost 8,000, which is 7% of the world's species. Uh, unfortunately, it's threatened by logging, mi mining, and dynamite fishing. So because it's so fortunate in, in its uh, biological resources, biodiversity is integral to Papua New Guinea way of life. Uh, Papua New Guinean said, land is our life, our physical life, food, and sustenance. Land is our social life. It is marriage. It is status. It is security. It is politics. In fact, it is our only world. When you take our land, you cut away the very heart of our existence. 
Uh, in terms of its cultural strength, P&G is an ideal location for testing a value-based approach like this due to its homogeneity of beliefs. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard that it has very rich uh, um, linguistic diversity. There's, there's, over eight, there's 800 languages in Papua New Guinea, yet 97% of the people are Christian. So it's very homogeneous uh, belief in terms of, it, of its faith. In addition, the indigenous people have customary land tenure controlling 97% of their land. Our project involves collaboration between both scientists, environmentalists, and religious leaders within Papua New Guinea and the U.S. So, um, so within the U.S., it's ourselves in Restoring Eden. So we provide the science conservation, and they provide the faith. Then it's three Papua New Guinea groups, Bismarck Ramu Group, which is a grassroots conservation and development group, the Indigenous Christian Environmental Network, which we helped, this project actually helped start, uh, which is a grassroots faith group, and a new one um, that we've started this year called Christians Advocating for Stewardship of the Environment, uh, which is a grassroots faith group. The approach is interdisciplinary and interdenominational um, as within Christian faith, since, as I said, it's 97% Christian. Um, it's got a strong local leader. This is Yat Powell, who's part of Bismarck Ramu, and he's, uh, it's really a PNG-driven project. While well, catalyzed from the outside by ourselves, Greenpeace, and Restoring Eden, the project's been taken to heart by local Papua New Guinea and NGOs and religious leaders. Our activities, over the last four years, we've conducted le le lectures and rallies on faith and science, visiting schools, churches, NGOs, government de departments, and communities. At least 10,000 people have been reached, have attended these lectures by Peter Illion of Restoring Eden and uh, PNG ministers with a primary message of stewardship that God loves all of creation and God did not confer authority without responsibility. My part to it is I provided, with Christina's help, um, a biodiversity um, lecture so that we're hoping we can provide both the faith and the science uh, in, future, in future years as well. The millions have heard about, read about the effort in the media. The first year, the project actually had an instant effect on behavior. Um, during the lecture in Medang, held in a litter-strewn soccer um, ring, at the urging of the Papua New Guinea minister, um, hundreds of members of the audience gathered trash, and they put it in bags held by um, people that were part of the project. The Medang city manager and owner of uh, the local uh, grocery store watched this and were so impressed that the next day they established a litter pickup campaign, which re would reward people with a food voucher if they continued to collect bags of litter. The ca litter campaign was highly publicized and um, spread to Papua New Guinea's two largest cities, uh, Ley and Moresby. We provided liturgical materials, including a book highlighting environmental passages from the Bible. We held uh, trainings with faith leaders and future leaders, showing them ways to highlight environmental issues and messages in their preaching and programs. And World Wildlife Fund invited us to come to their um, Kikori project site, which is their, they have a partnership with Chevron, um, to conduct a pastor training there. In the future, we plan um, an attitudinal study in collaboration with the University of the South Pacific um, uh, creating environmentally friendly enterprises for these communities. Um, Greenpeace, for example, has uh, supported a tapa cloth project in uh, Berkeley, which supports um, a native art form, and it's, it's now shown in, the museum, in an art museum in Berkeley. Um, ecological restoration efforts, policy training, and a web, uh, website for outreach. This is... This is um, uh, seminarians at a, at a university, so this is training future religious leaders, and this is what the lecture rally looks like. Um, the people have their hands raised because they've been asked to commit to um, caring for creation, and so that gives you an indication of the support um, of the group. Really, really everywhere we've, we've gone, we've had this kind of attendance and support. In fact, uh, the Lutheran church was kind of hostile to our uh, project in 1999, because they didn't know where it came from, it was just coming in new to the country. And this year, they've supported it wholeheartedly, and they've helped us um, link up with other groups. Albert Schweitzer said, let a man once begin to think about the links which connect him with the life that fills the world. And he cannot but bring to bear upon his own life and all of other life that comes within his reach the principle of reverence for life. Together, the scientific conservation and faith communities can work to foster a sense of wonder and empathy towards the other living creatures that share this planet with us. Together we can work to foster increased stewardship of the earth. Thank you.
since we're running a little bit late, I ha um, let's take questions. And if anybody wants to stay after, I have a minute or two of the po of Papua New Guinea if you want to see it. So. religions are based upon exactly the opposite, that humans are superior, animals are there for the basis of the use by humans. Are you in attempting to alter that perception in, in the sense of your religious science faith connection? Is it something that you feel has always been there and that I've misinterpreted the problems that we see with how religion has misused animals during the course of history? history. Um. Yeah, that's a hard question. <laughs> uh, personally, I, I think uh, it's, I'm just trying to help redirect the uh, attention um, that clearly there's enough passages in the Bible that indicate, uh, for example, Noah's Ark, that we have a covenant, that the covenant is not between God and man. The covenant is between God and man and all the other creatures on the earth. So um, I, I know you can use the Bible that way. You, know, you can pick and choose depending on your various point of view, and there are other, even there's evangelical environmental network on the other side, there's you know, plenty of evangelicals that are greatly opposed to this approach. So um, uh, all I can do, you know, you could, maybe you could weigh them, <laughs> you know, cut out the number of passages in the Bible that would support this point of view versus the other. Um, I, I just think clearly the, the, uh, that the, it's useful to link up with the faith community because most faiths uh, emphasize stewardship. Other questions? For Heather or Glenn, too, any questions on the fish? Right here. On your old uh, probably part of the coin, on the uh, stickers of the industry response, such as the Dolphin Safe stickers, does, uh, does applying to get those stickers it cause the product's price to increase at all?
in the optional labelings, if this increases the product's price, how is that supposed to motivate? What do you mean in the optional labelings? Like MSC. It's like uh, NSC and Dolphin Safe and sure. things that they don't they don't have to get this labeling, yeah. but it but it's allegedly makes their product look better. Sure. If it's going to make it more expensive, how is uh, the average person going to walk to the supermarket and feel more motivated to spend the extra money? I think it's. I think that it's. Um, I mean, wh where you see the optional labeling uh, for NSC is, is Whole Foods, and their seafood tends to be more expensive. And that's definitely an approach uh, working on consumer awareness. And I feel like our goal is through the buyers, uh, through you know buying strategies, we're going to give customers a peace of mind when they walk in that it's all sustainable what they see, and it's not going it, to. It won't influence the price. So I guess what I'm saying is I think that there is a market for those optional. And the optional label, like Dolphin Safe, is really a public thing. I mean, it became, you know, a few years ago at a time when people were really looking for that Dolphin Safe label to buy that, whether or not it was the same price or pants or can of tuna as something that was not labeled Dolphin Safe. There was really a lot of public pressure to have that, you know, on Bumblebee and Chicken and Sam and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Sophia? very exciting and, and obviously you're, you're doing a great amount of work to create best practices. How are you going to contain, how are you going to deal with the global market for fish? Uh, is, the hope, uh, is the hope to get volunteerism in Europe and in South America and Japan or are you thinking you've got to go to the GTO or, or what other, you know, eventually you're going to want to make sure that this stuff isn't escaping and it's sort of race to the bottom in certain, in certain markets. Oh, I'll just say, I'll just start by saying um, how to take it to the global market and how to avoid um, just having somebody leave kind of a, a national standard or something, go find other places to source seafood from that aren't as 
sustainable and everything looks at? Right, I mean, what, you know, again, someone decides not to play and, and, and takes the bottom end of the market and, and you left open the fisheries, so to speak, to that kind of rating. I mean, eventually, do you need some kind of global accord? I mean, That's a question. Do we need yes. some kind of global accord? Well, let me just speak to this project in general. This was certainly a top-down initiative for Royal Aquas in the Netherlands, who owns supermarket chains in Asia, Europe, and Latin America. And our hope is that with the success um, successful steps in this project that we would be able to translate this into the buying power of that supermarket chain. And I, I really see that this is something similar to, um, I'll give you an example, Environmental Defense has an alliance for business and innovation, environmental innovation, and they have worked with FedEx to reduce the, um, to increase the recycled content of their packaging. And they went into that saying, you know what, as soon as we get done with you, we're going to go to UPS and we're going to translate this throughout the industry. And so one of the exciting things about this endeavor is that we don't believe it's always going to stay with Stop and Shop. We don't believe it's always going to stay, in fact, US-based. Our hope is to really have this grow and be something that, you know, if if people start to realize that they're going to Stop and Shop based on the fact that they feel good about walking in the door and the sustainability choices that they'll have there, I have a feeling that Shaw's and other places are going to jump on board and want to do this as well. And I think that, um, this is kind of one way for us to jump into what's really a systemic approach, meaning, you know, Stop and Shop buys orders of magnitude more fish than Whole Foods. And Whole Foods and companies like Bread and Circus fill a small niche for people that, you know, not only can afford to, but are interested in the origin of their food. And our hope is to actually expand this so that more of the majority of the general public can do that. And, and that includes taking it more on a global scale, but I mean, in terms of whether we're going to come out and advocate for a global solution, I think that's separate from this project. This project is really to look at the business decisions, you know, within the business community, and with other environmental groups and other projects that we work on, we work on marine conservation on a global scale. It's a little separate from this. I, I just would like to add a comment to your question, the last question. And this question. is Greg Stone, the Vice President here of Global Marine Progress, who's our boss. <laughs> and that is that there's a vested interest in all of these industries to source from sustainable seafood. Not, and that's because they can have seafood 10, 20 years from now. But a lot of these distributors have begun to realize that this is not an inexhaustible source. That if they don't pay attention to what they're doing, they're not going to have a product to sell in the future. So it's really in their own economic interest to do this. It's not necessarily a, a very soft-sided stewardship setting, well, that, that's definitely part of it with Royal Apple, because they, they have a very high um, ethical standard about their behavior, but it's just good business for, from every point of view. Right here. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. It's actually a should be shut down because eventually there will be nothing to fish. But for people who are making their lives on this, how do you deal with it? Well, one thing I think that's sort of important is that the minute these, these fisheries are shut down, these boats can ship to a different species. So, um, and they're, they're, King Crab in Alaska is coming back strong. It's rebuilding. These boats are going to ship to that. Um, and a lot of them can be refitted to, to fish something like pomegranate. That's really well managed. So, um. Well, that's a specific example, too, with snow crab. But I would say one of the other exciting things that we felt at the beginning of this project was that Ahold seemed willing to not necessarily always end the relationship that they have of buying certain fish, but also to encourage those places to move in the direction of sustainability. So one um, you know example might be thinking out into the future. If there's a... If there's a fleet that actually, to make some extra money on the side, their guys take the sh any sharks that they bring on board while they're fishing for something else, they take the shark fins off 
and they sell the shark fins for a little bit of profit, which is extra money for these people living in the communities. One of the approaches might be to make a recommendation from this EcoSound project that Apple increase the penny a pound or how much they pay to buy the seafood from that so that the captains can funnel that money back to these guys to not do the shark finning, to actually let the sharks go. So there's a couple um, methods to actually um, encouraging them to, to be better practices of you know sustainable and also solutions than to continue in the practice that they're doing so that we recommend not using them. And once we develop the report, that's not final. Another part of the project is that we update the reports on an annual basis. developing a, a vendor packet presently that uh, myself and people from Apple are going to hit these specific vendors and they have to account for everything that they buy through the buyers. So myself and a, and a buyer for Apple will go to this vendor and just check his, check his paper on an annual basis. Um, and that way we can monitor, if, if we su have suggested shifting sourcing, uh, we'll be able to, to check that out. It's just that the questions that are coming at us, the perception of EcoSound is really very one-sided. And the prong towards the governmental and the global pieces is a little missing within the one project which you have, the prong towards actually dealing with fishermen to actually work with you to improve the methods and the technology of capturing fish it is missing as well. So is there a little fear on, on your part that the general perception will be in many ways negating the really good of the project and there's a way of maybe making integrating the other ends of this so that you come off as looking more than just simply one-sided don't buy it from here buy it from there and uh, you run into that you mean within perception. the project itself as opposed to other things that we do either at the aquarium in other projects working with fishermen you mean within the project right. itself Is there the fear that this doesn't look like a very balanced approach? I essentially take this as one component of our sustainable fisheries initiative. And maybe in some ways what we've done is only let you know this one cornerstone to the program area that we have here. And there certainly are a lot of other initiatives that Glenn and I and Greg are really involved in that, that talk about creating marine protected areas, that have forums where we bring in scientists and managers and everybody to talk about the ground fish crisis here in New England or things like that. So, yeah, there's certainly, and in fact, I mean, that's a really helpful suggestion. Maybe at the beginning of this talk, we give a little more background as to the other things that we do um, within the conservation department and within the research department and within the education department here at the aquarium to give people a little broader perspective of the different kinds of um, partnerships that we have. And the that's a really great suggestion. You know, if, if that addresses your yes, question, I exactly. hope that that's what you're looking for. One final question, anybody? 